Hello and welcome to the End the Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the MBM podcast. I'm really excited for today's guest on the show, but just quickly, I wanted to announce a couple of things. So first of all, MBM just turned one year old. If you follow me on social media, with the Facebook page and on uh, Mastering the Business of Yoga on Instagram, I put a nice little post up there. Um, it kind of almost slipped my mind. I was like, oh wow, February 1st, it passed. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I launched MBM at the beginning of February last year. So just a quick shout out to everyone who's been on the podcast, everyone who's listened to the podcast the entire time, supported, shared everything. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. Uh, you all mean a ton to me. And obviously, I'm still doing this because it's resonating with people, which is amazing. Uh, when I first put it out there, I was like, I don't know if anyone's going to listen, which is always the fear of putting yourself out there in any way, as we all know, as yogi entrepreneurs. So thank you so much for that. We've got 46 episodes. This is episode number 47, and I'm really excited to see where the next year of MBM goes, which kind of segues perfectly into my second announcement. If you are a part of my newsletter community, you heard about this last week, um, and you can jump on the newsletter at www.mbmyoga.com forward slash newsletter. But I'm test piloting a new part of the MBO business, which involves a coaching aspect. And so in my real life, when I'm not doing MBO or the travel podcast that I host with uh, my partner, Ryan, uh, we are both advisors for uh, education startups. So I've been doing this for a number of months now. It's something that I'm really passionate about, and I want to bring that element of my life into MBOM. So I'm offering complimentary 30-minute sessions for anyone who has something that they want to talk about. So you don't need to be a business owner to do this. If you're a new yoga teacher and you're struggling with what to do, book a call. Let's have a conversation about it. If you are a studio owner, book a call. Let's talk about how you can streamline your business, grow your business, evolve your business, whatever you're looking to do. So you can book those sessions at mbomyoga.youcanbookme.com. And I'll put a link to that on the show notes for this page, as well as in the description for this. So if you want to book a session with me, I would love to chat with you. It's 30 minutes. It's completely free, no strings attached. And I would love to have a conversation with you and get to know you a little bit better. And so on to today's episode, I'm really excited for today's guest, which is David Moreno. And David is based out of Berkeley, California. He has been a yoga teacher for a number of years. So a lot of our conversation kind of revolves on the changing industry. Uh, But what intrigued me about David was... Uh, that he runs these trips to really interesting places. So he does yoga retreats or as what he'll, he'll say that he calls in the episode, uh, travel trips to different places all over the world that not a lot of people go to. And so he's running one in May that is going to, to Petra. And when I heard that he was running a retreat to Petra, I was like, wow, that's so cool. I need to talk to him. So we talk a lot about how he got into running these travel trips in these really interesting locations all over the world, as well as some tips and tricks for those of you who are like, oh my gosh, that's my dream. That's what I want to do. And so really great episode. David's awesome. And I can't wait for you to hear what he has to share. So without further ado, here's David. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, David. It's it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, and you're joining me from the Bay Area in California. Is that right? Yep. Berkeley. Awesome. I have a, a friend who just moved to Berkeley. She loves it out there. Great. I was thinking that we would start with how you first got into yoga, if you could tell me a little bit about that journey for you. Oh, sure. Um uh, I had danced professionally a long, long time ago, and when I was changing that career or stopping dancing professionally, I needed to do something to have that experience in my body of being fully in it. And it was actually one of my dance colleagues that started teaching yoga, and so I started taking some classes with her. This was in Los Angeles during the late 70s. And um, 
I just continued to 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 take classes. It, they were really random back then. Um, you couldn't really find a class like you can now. It was common, even in a city like Los Angeles, to drive for an hour to take someone's class, and there were only so many classes a week. Um, and that's kind of how it went for a while. And so it was always kind of like a part-time practice. Um, and then I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I started finding another couple little classes, mostly geared for housewives and not a big deal and very low key. And then I started doing uh, Iyengar yoga and Ashtanga yoga hit. And that's when I got totally committed and started practicing full time. And then after about five years of studying and practicing, that's when I started teaching for T.S. Little in Santa Fe. Okay, cool. And so what kind of inspired you to take your practice from being simply just a practitioner to wanting to teach yoga? Oh, oh my gosh. That's, uh, you know, I guess if you just love something enough, all of a sudden you realize like you have a view on it and you have something to share on it. And, and, um, also, I had done theater background, you know, dance theater. So I was used to being in front of people that it didn't intimidate me to get up in front of a class and do something. So I had sort of a natural proclivity towards teaching and also just being in love with it, you know, just being in love with yoga enough to want to do that. Okay. Yeah, I love that. It's always so interesting to hear with people who have been teaching for a while how they first got into teaching because people come from it from all different backgrounds and for all different reasons. One of the primary uh, launching points was at that time, you know, people went to India to study with Patabi Joyce or with Iyengar or some of the other Indian teachers. And at one point, my teacher, who was T.S. at that time, you know, basically handed me the keys of the studio and said, "Okay, we're going to India for a month, (laughs) you know. Will you cover these classes while I'm away? So it was really like, you know, he was going to do more of his own study. And that's when I actually stepped into teaching. That's so cool to hear. It sounds like such a different world of teaching than it is now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Teacher trainings came later. You know, teacher training certification came much later. but, uh, But again, I had studied with one teacher for five years in one studio, which is that in itself is rare at this point in time where most students study with several teachers in several different studios. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I found really interesting. Definitely with the podcast, I've heard from so many different people who are like, yeah, I was actually teaching before I was officially certified, which is kind of a little bit of a no, no nowadays. Like if you're not certified and you're, you're found out teaching, you know, a yoga studio could get in trouble. Um, and then people also, like you said, do study with so many different people. I remember when I first got into yoga, I was so confused by this, this idea that teachers would talk about their teacher and it'd be like one different person that they'd kind of studied with for so long. And I didn't really understand it until I got more into yoga and understood sort of how yoga had transitioned to the point that I came into it. Very different. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in the yoga teaching, I guess, sort of atmosphere over the last couple of years? Oh my God. Oh my God. That's such a huge topic. Uh, um, because I have seen so much. I mean, I like to joke about how when I started doing yoga, well, first of all, let's go back to like the one teacher process, right? When you have one teacher, they really can track your progress and really work with you on the places where you're challenged and really just stay on that. You know, when you're bopping in and out of a lot of classes in a lot of different studios with a lot of different teachers, nobody's really tracking your progress or your intention unless you're doing a one-on-one with that person or going through some kind of advanced training. So that's that in itself is one really big difference. You know, people can be doing yoga for five years now and haven't learned some of these essential components of yoga. And, and there's no one there actually correcting or suggesting or guiding that student. So that's one of the, the big things. Um, I also joke about before, you know, back then, and you, 
you can appreciate this as a Canadian. <laughs> there was no Lululemon, you know, guys wore gym shorts, underwear, whatever it took, because there wasn't a market, you know, and, and there was always somebody at the studio who was a carpenter who made some really heavy yoga blocks <laughs> that, you know, if you drop them, they almost, they almost put a hole in the floor. Uh, you know, I've seen it go from that to the, I, I'm very outspoken about the fact that I work for a hedge fund at this point in time. I no longer actually know who owns the studio that I teach for in, in the Bay Area, one of them. It used to be very much that the studio was usually owned by the teacher who was the principal teacher, and that was their studio, and that's what a studio was. Uh, now, uh, um, this studio has been bought out twice and it is owned basically by hedge fund and i don't really know who owns the place i don't really know who writes the checks uh so i've seen this world really go from very personal very one-on-one -on -one focus to very impersonal corporate commercial yoga wow yeah, I've never taught for a studio that was owned by a hedge fund. I've only ever taught at studios that were still sort of that smaller personal feel. Uh, what's well, it like as a teacher to be a part of that community? Like, do you lose some of that personal connection? Absolutely. 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 I mean, it really becomes more like this is the, this is where you work. You know, this is where I come in. Fortunately, I've had some of the same students at this one studio for 13 years and you know they have come pretty regularly they've gone through all the transitions with me so that in that sense it still still feels very much like community to me but it used to be that you know not only did you have a personal relationship with the owner of the studio but with the other teachers on staff people get hired people leave I don't even know who's teaching the other classes you know outside of some of the senior teachers that are still there so that's very odd to me. There's no really uh, captain at the helm. And so it feels like the boat's just kind of floating uh, in, in this world uh, that we are in. And there's nobody really, there's just no personal connection. So it becomes a place for me where it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, this is where I go. This is where I teach. This is where the students are. It's still close to where I live. It's still convenient, all this stuff. Um, but it's very different. It's very different from caring about who owns the studio and caring about the studio and having a personal connection with it. I have a personal connection because I've been there for 13 years in this one location. And, um, but it's very different. And if you're new and you just start teaching, you don't have that history with it. You don't know who taught there before. You don't know anything about the space. It's just a place where you come and teach at. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's very different. Yeah, that's super interesting to hear. It's, it's um, something that I found when I started teaching was that it can actually be like a lot lonelier than I would have anticipated. And that's kind of just being self-employed in general, especially if you work from home. It's something that I really love about teaching communities is finding a studio where you can really come together with your fellow teachers and you kind of have that sense of coworkers or camaraderie. And I guess you probably wouldn't get that as much somewhere that there's no direct owner kind of cultivating that yeah it's not only through the teachers but when i was in santa fe and you know studying with tia's that we would uh on sunday mornings the whole community would have like a potluck at somebody's home afterwards and we you know you just hung out with the people that you were doing very very deep practice with and now people come for you know years and years at a time. They don't even know the person's name next to them unless they go on a retreat or take a workshop or something. You know, it's very just impersonal. Yeah, I'm just thinking about to like my home studio that um, I'm closest with in Canada, and it's it's in a tourist town um, in, near to a national park, and so there's a ton of people who are just coming and going. You know, the locals I kind of. I know from living there, but there's often people, I mean, it's more often in, than not that the people beside me or around me, I don't actually know. And mm -hmm. I found that when I was in Atlanta, Georgia, I was at a really small studio that had a really homey feel. And it was so nice because people would just introduce themselves and it really makes your practice so much different and your teaching so much different. If you can connect with those people on a deeper level than just the physical asana. Absolutely. 
And then, so coming from a background of studying with one teacher, has it been really important to you as a teacher to have students that are with you for like the long haul? Well, it's just a very different situation. Um, you know, when you go out of your way, when you drive an hour to go take somebody's class, and that's something you do for many years, that's very different from stopping by the studio that's closest to your house on the way home from work. And I find that, yes, I have a following of students, but it's it's only those people that go on retreat with me or do workshops or and a lot of students don't even do workshops any longer. You know, they just, they just want their hour and a half class if, if that much. Uh, and so is it important to me? Yes, it's important to me. And it's just changed so much from what it used to be. I mean, I, I really, and, and when I say I studied with one teacher, I say one teacher for five years, another teacher for eight years, you know, it's kind of moved like that. Um, so I have studied with more than one teacher, but, you know, for, for commitments of time to that teacher and people don't, most people that are coming to most of the studios, I find are fitting it in between their work and their lives. It's not the central focus of their lives, even though they do it regularly. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's interesting hearing about how yoga communities are so different in different parts of the world. And I think that, you know, they're, they're the same on so many levels, but then there's also these differences based on cities or towns or these small pockets of yoga and, and that sort of thing. So it's cool to hear about that. Well, you know, what else is true about this is when I started teaching internationally, when I, I started teaching internationally, like in the, the late nineties and at that time, you know, traveling teachers was like a big deal still. And, uh, I really enjoyed teaching in, in other countries because people were much more open to hearing things and much more, um, hungry to really learn something, you know, and, it had a very different flavor to me than teaching in the Bay Area, teaching in other big cities. Um, yeah, where there's that attitude of like, oh, yeah, we know this already or we've done that. We don't need to do it again. Or, you know, it's just very different level of appreciation and um, willingness to study and to go deeper. Amazing. And how did you first start get into, getting into teaching internationally? Um. Well, you know, I really feel like it was timing. I I studied with a lot of the senior teachers in America just before they all became celebrities, you know, and I was like second string out. And so um, I had a friend who had an international business where he would do uh, retreats around the world and travel trips. And I got asked by him as I was as I was teaching, you know, would you come and teach yoga for this retreat in Mexico? Would you do so? It was a part of, of a bigger program, right? And and then because I had my foot in the door there, then I could approach other companies that were doing things in Thailand or Greece or wherever they were doing it and say, hey, you know, I've just taught for this other company. I've done this for them you know, do you need a yoga teacher or I understand you have an opening for a yoga teacher. And so that's, I got my foot in the door. And then, you know, once I was able to say, I just taught in Greece for a month, just taught in Mexico, then, you know, I became, I I sort of like made my own resume as I went, you know, it it built upon itself. And then other people would say, oh, and, and then also what I would do is once I was asked to come out someplace to teach, and, you know, part of my expenses were paid to get there or all of it to get there. Then I would put feelers out in the area, either in the same country or the nearby country. I'm in your part of the world. Would you be interested? And at that time, again, you were talking to owners of studios, not an administrator. You know what I'm saying? It was, again, it was personal at that level. And they would say yes. Usually they said yes. I very seldom somebody say no, you know, but, um, so I kind of just like one foot in front of the other and good timing, I think. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome to hear. I've, um, 
I wasn't born until 1989, so this isn't even a possibility, but I've thought about how it would have been so interesting and so much, I don't know, maybe, I don't, I don't know if easier is the right word, but I think easier might be the best word in this case, but easier to be a bigger teacher and teach internationally had I been able to teach like in the nineties, which, you know, I was, I was a toddler. So (laughs) obviously that wasn't possible. (laughs) The market wasn't oversaturated, right? The market wasn't oversaturated. And then by the early, early 2000, uh, students were like, you know, I want to be taking, become a teacher so that I can go teach in Hawaii or Greece or all the places that I had been Bali, you know, um, it was like part of their intention was like, oh, I want to do that too. Yes, it's great fun. And that so that became one of the motivating factors um, for teachers uh, more recently. And not everybody te- leads retreats all over the world and everybody's all at the same hot spots at the same time. You know, it's it's very oversaturated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's something that I really noticed since coming into the teaching world is like, you know, how do you make yourself stand out when you're a newer teacher and there's people who have been doing this for years and years and, you know, every yoga teacher wants to go teach in, I mean, I'm in Bali right now. I'm in Ubud. I mean, there's tons of yoga teachers who probably want to teach at Yoga Barn. <laughs> yeah, I've taught there. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful I studio. I taught Yoga Barn and I, I taught at the uh, Bali Spirit Festival the first several years that it was it had just started. So, that, oh, yeah, I was cool. that way. You know, I was there. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any piece of, pieces of advice for anyone who's listening, who's maybe a newer teacher who's like, yes, I want to do what David is doing. How do I do this? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's so hard to frame it for this moment in time and space here. Um, it's, it is such a a different world. Uh, I think it's important that if you're, if, if your intention is to build a following and to be able to have students follow you around the world or join you in other parts of the world to do some yoga, that you definitely have to be really dedicated and really have your own signature to what you're doing. And I don't mean signature like branding as much as I mean your own integrity and uh, just your commitment to the practice. I think if that is first and foremost the most important thing to you, then the other things will be a natural progression from that. You know, if your intention is to like, oh, yeah, I want to teach in Bali and I want to teach in Hawaii and I want to teach in fabulous places in Mexico, then it's like going in the back door. You know, it's like, yeah, that that might happen, but it's a competitive market out there. Everybody's already doing that. So why should I go study with you or take a trip with you to Greece, you know, um, unless you're a really good teacher that I really enjoy studying with and I'm curious about this adventure with you. Right. So having a sort of a following at, in your home base is is important then so that people can you know follow along with like what with what you're doing they can learn about you know how you teach they can choose to either like you or not like you and then once they're following along with you it's easier to kind of i guess convince them on or sell them on coming on a trip with you because they already love the way you teach and you get to spend that time together absolutely and so then in terms of running retreats when did you first start doing doing your international retreats in in the 90s you said well yeah basically and well some of those were like mostly working for other people like i said there is an organization from london that that had for years done events in greece where Former teachers like David Swenson, uh, the Stunga tradition, taught there and had already this sort of in program that's been in place for quite a while. And so at first I started teaching for other people within their programs uh, and then like sort of out of a continuation of leading workshops and retreats, I started going back to some of these places uh, and producing my, you know, like, okay, we're going to do this week in New Mexico where I used to live and where I taught for many years. 
going back there to this Buddhist center and do my own retreat instead of being part of somebody else's. And that's how it just kind of started. The same with international travel. I used to um, co-lead trips to different parts of the world. Uh, and I was always brought on so that as part of that journey, I could then lead a daily yoga practice or something as part of that. So then I just started uh, getting more confidence and working out the uh, or getting the ropes down so that I could, you know, start producing my, my own and do it that way. Awesome. That's great. I love the idea of co-leading something when you're first starting out to kind of have somebody there who can maybe has more experience than you, or maybe you can kind of work through like the challenges together. I think that's a great idea. Well, you know, international travels, I mean, it's a huge deal. So like, uh, as you know, I'm about to take a group back to Petra in Jordan. And I did that last year, you know, and to the responsibility of like, Oh my God, I just got 20 people that said, yes, they're going to join me on the other side of the world in an Arab country at this point in time and you know even though i know it's going to be fantastic that's a huge responsibility you know and i certainly wasn't ready when i first started to be you know taking on something that big and you know you have to all of a sudden become an administrator as well as a yoga teacher and you have to be really clear on if that's appealing to you i Part of that's appealing to me. Organizing, creating an event is as appealing to me as teaching. I love both equally as much. However, I don't like all the nitty gritty little details and financial stuff and I'm endlessly marketing and, you know, it becomes this huge additional responsibility. So that's the disadvantage of producing something yourself. And the advantage of working with another organization is they usually have that part of it in place, right? They have the admin in place, they have the PR in place, and you're the guest teacher. So, and of course, you don't make as much money, but but then again, they're doing all that work. And you know, so I contract other people to help me uh, with some of the stuff that I hate doing <laughs> the most. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's a really important business lesson, and. I know it's something that Tim Ferriss talks about um, in terms of like hacking on his podcast is like the 80, 20 rule, like do, do less with your time and the things that you don't like doing kind of find people who do like doing them because there's people who really thrive on organization. There's people who specialize in marketing. There's people who, you know, really love doing accounting. So you might as well have those people who specialize in that sort of thing, help you out with that. Absolutely, you know, because it consumes a lot of time, and you're spending more time doing admin than practicing or teaching it. It, it that's not right, you know. It's it's a real sacrifice. Yeah, definitely. And so, for people who are looking to kind of jump from teaching in studio to running retreats, would you say that starting small is is pretty key for being successful with retreats down the line? Oh, you know, I'll apply the old Ayurvedic rule here of for whom and for when, you know, somebody that already lives in paradise and is doing something locally is, is going to be really attractive than somebody that's out in the middle of nowhere and trying to find a place to go to. So I want to distinguish also between like a retreat held at a retreat center is very different from an international or a travel trip. Like even it could be like uh, yoga and hiking in Yosemite, right? Those are very different uh, circumstances and take different kinds of organization than, you know, here's a retreat center. I'm going to uh, reserve these dates at your place and I'm going to send you this money as a deposit. And then I'm going to show up there and basically you're going to take care of everything else, right? That's a very different trip than if we are hiking in Yosemite and dealing with nature, which could be doing anything, you know, in a drought or, or rain or, or your international travel trip where an airport's closed down or people get delayed. You know, those are very different uh, journeys and experiences. So absolutely, if that's not your capacity to take on something too big, definitely start slow. Definitely work with somebody who's going to do a lot of the other work for you, like 
you know, maybe even announcing your retreat on their, uh, their membership list so that people beyond your immediate student body can hear about that. Um, though definitely start, definitely start there, you know? Okay, cool. Yeah. I think that you made a really, really good differentiation there that, um, lots of people probably haven't thought about is that there's the difference between, you know, if you're going to Costa Rica, for example, at a yoga retreat center where they already prepare, you know, vegetarian, healthy, organic meals, and they've already got these beautiful places to stay and they've got the yoga facility. And all you have to do is really plan your days around that and plan your, your sessions as a yoga teacher versus, you know, if you're taking somebody to Yosemite is a great example. I mean, you're taking people to Jordan, which if you look at the schedule for that, you're obviously doing a lot more than just planning for yoga. Right. Now, you know, on those bigger trips like India, Jordan, even in Bali. uh, And one of the reasons I got to teach at Yoga Barn was because I brought a group of students to Bali for the first time way back when, literally when Yoga Barn just opened. And, um, you know, after being there with a group, that's when I made my connection with Yoga Barn and met those people and Megan and everybody and then then got involved with their world. But, um, yeah, it's it's very different. Um, it's definitely better if you're starting to, to have somebody else do most of that work for you. But then again, you know, it, those things cost and it, it's a, it's just a real trade off. Um, and you have to be honest with yourself, like, what are you willing to take on? What are you not? You know, there are several yoga couples also that seem to be able to pull off a retreat together. And that's helpful, you know, because you've got your own little your own little pod of of people doing this and doing that as opposed to doing it on your own. But I definitely work with tour companies like if i when i was in bali i worked with a tour guide there so again i organized the trip with that person they take care of the details buses transportation that sort of thing you know and i don't i i I don't have to worry about that specifically but i do have to include all those costs in an event that i'm producing right okay and then what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from running treats internationally, like taking people to Bali, taking people to Jordan? Well, you know, the people that you get are usually people that like to travel. Like there's definitely the travel types out there. And what's appealing and what's always appealing about yoga is that it provides a centering and a communal experience that is different from just random travel, right? So that people, they're getting the tourist experience, but they're also getting a daily way of connecting and being in practice as they experience, you know, a a new culture. Yeah, I like that because it it does act, it's like almost like, you know, people are going on a yoga retreat, but it's also this amazing excuse for them to take a really cool trip to a, a, an amazing new place. Right. And then in terms of like the organization side of it, what are some of the like business lessons you've learned from running those types of retreats? From the international travel trips, so I, I call them travel Ventures so that you're it's really a travel trip and that you're doing yoga as part of that as opposed to again a yoga retreat where you're doing yoga specifically and then doing little outings or whatever you do from there it's kind of like the reverse of that um well i think the biggest thing is that it's 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 a very big deal and, and you know every group Every group karmically comes together in some different way. You never know who's going to be part of that group. Often it's an amazing experience and all the right people come together. And sometimes it's challenging, you know. Sometimes there are certain people that uh, are just who they are and, it, you know, they're being stressed by being in a different country. They're being stressed by uh, meeting new people. You know, it, it can work both ways. You know, it's not always – like uh, they're just coming to a retreat center. So people's um, people can be challenged just by 
traveling. You know, you're out of your comfort zone, which is what we love to do. This is what we widely love to travel. We love to be out of our comfort zone. And at the same time, we hate being out of our comfort zone. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a real challenge and it can also be a challenging thing. And like I said, you, there's so many circumstances that are out of your control, but that's also part of the magic of it. And usually it always comes together sooner or later. Now, there are trips like like travel, certain countries are a lot more challenging to travel through than others. So like I've traveled and taken groups to India several times. And, you know, you spend a lot of time in India getting from point A to point B. I mean, you can spend four to six hours in a bus. And then so your yoga practice that day, if it didn't happen very early, may happen very late or it just depends on the travel schedule itself. Whereas in Jordan, you can visit the whole country in five hours. I mean, you can drive around the whole country for five, in five hours pretty much, uh, getting from point A to point B. The longest you would have to travel, I think, is like four and a half hours, five hours. So that means that there's more time to, to schedule your yoga practice in the day. But sometimes, you know, you have to – when you have to be on the Ganga in, in India before sunrise – you know, which of course you want to do. This is the whole reason for going to India. Um, you know, that, that means you're not practicing at 3.30 in the morning, you know, and, and you may even skip it one day because of travel like that. Um, so the advantage of a retreat is that it's guaranteed. You know, that's the focus is really on the yoga and anything extra is anything extra. Whereas on a travel trip, you're really there to travel, but the yoga is holding it together as much as it can, uh, depending on which country you, you're in. You know, Bali is certain, like one of those countries, it's small enough. You can always get somewhere within the course of a day without a lot of strain. And so that leaves more time for uh, practice. Okay, yeah, cool. I love that. I was kind of um, giggling to myself on on this end of the phone uh, when you said, as travelers, we we love to get out of our comfort zone, but we also hate to get out of our comfort zone because I just traveled right. Myanmar for a couple of weeks, and that's how I felt for most of the trip. I was like, oh man, I just want like my comforts of home, and I was like, no, you don't. You're here for a reason, <laughs> and it's like this internal mental battle of like, this is why you love traveling, but I just want this to be easier. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And so in terms of marketing a travel trip versus a yoga retreat, how do you go about marketing those differently? Because it seems like you'd attract a completely different audience to those two different types of retreats. Um, it's hard. It's really a good question. And I don't have any great answer for that. I basically advertise to the same audience as much as I can. Certainly social media has the potential of getting that information out to a broader base, but um, that's not guaranteed. And, you know, some years I'll do a trip and it'll sell out. And then I think, and everybody goes, Oh, you got to do this again next year. So, so I book it again for next year and then no one signs up, you know, for it's timing. It's all, it's so it's, it's kind of, it's like any kind of retail. There's, There's no real way of knowing what's going to happen. And, you know, you can incur cost if something that you put deposits on uh, doesn't fill up or you just never know. And because uh, not only are people a little bit more hesitant to travel right now because of everything that's going on, especially in the United States, um, uh, you know, people are always a little bit more shy about traveling. And, especially on international trips and which is ironic to me because there's uh, just as much unrest and um, safety issues in major cities in the United States and, and in Europe uh, than there are like being out in the middle of the, the Sinai desert or being out in Wadi Rum desert in Jordan, something like that. But people have this perception that that might be more dangerous. And so Right now, you know, there's a climate where people are a little bit more hesitant. And the other thing that's changed for me in international travel and these kinds of trips, it used to be back in the day, like up to like 20 years ago, if you were going to do an international trip, and this is, again, pre-internet, so probably before you were born. (laughs) um, (laughs) um, We used encyclopedias when I was a small child. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> people plan their trip six months in advance. You know, you just plan. You you know, you knew that you were going to India. You knew that you were going to Thailand. You know, next summer. Now people will wait to the last minute because we're used to like you go online, you buy a last minute ticket, you go. Right? There's no. Uh, I've been planning this my whole life, or uh, we've been organizing this for a good part of this year. You know, people will make up their minds much closer to the end, which makes it more challenging to know how many people you're actually going to have on the trip until very late in the process. And that affects how many hotel rooms do you rent, how big is your bus, you know, all those things uh, become much more like last minute than they used to be. And so that becomes a, a bigger challenge these days. Okay. Yeah. No, that's interesting to hear. It's, it's so fascinating to hear how like the yoga, like t- being a yoga teacher has changed so much over the last, I guess, like 20 years. And then also how much that impacts running retreats as well. I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. And you know, even there were fewer retreat centers, uh, in the past. So Now that there are more, you know, the cost for those retreat centers and the per head per night rate is much higher than like everything else. You know, everything is more expensive than it used to be. And so um, there are more options about where to go. But also some of these places, which are quite beautiful, also charge very much hotel rates. And, you know, they get top dollar for your being there. So in a sense, going to retreat can cost a lot more than it used to. Um, and, and international travel can sometimes cost more just on one side of it. But once you're in the country, then it's actually cheaper, you know, so it really varies. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's something that, I mean, that's the reason that I'm in Asia is because I wasn't making enough money to live comfortably in Canada or the U.S., whereas in Asia, it's like once I've paid for my flight, I can I can live like a queen over here. It's so much more affordable for me. Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's pretty good. Um, I'm curious if you are running a travel trip in an international location do you make a point of like scouting out that place or having traveled it yourself before you do it or do you just kind of dive in if you like the idea of going to that place i pretty much dive in it and it really depends um mostly i dive in and sometimes you know at best i get someplace a a week before the group comes out where I get to like either do a test run to some of the locations or meet with the tour guide or, or check out the hotel rooms, make sure they're up to speed for me. And I mean, I'm, clearly this has been done mostly beforehand, but it's always different when you're there, you know, and especially when you're working with international companies, there's always language discrepancies and things that, you know, everybody's English is good, but do we really understand what we're talking about? You know, so <laughs> So in, in an ideal situation, you would have been everywhere for the before they get there, and that's that seldom happens because one, it's not cost effective to me to be out there for a whole week sometimes before an event, you know, and and, and I mean it's just usually not possible financially to do it that way. So a lot of times I'm seeing things for the first time. Now with Petra, I was out there a week before. I attended a huge. Uh, Jordanian wedding out there and then went to some of the sites so I at least had that under my belt before the group showed up um, but the, you know in an ideal world that would be how it is but it's not always that way now the advantage of going back a second or third time even if it's, if it's to the same retreat center you know you know what to expect you know how good the food was you know what the downfalls are you uh or if I go back to this country, I know what the weather's like. I know what to expect in terms of currency. And, you know, so that's one of the advantages of doing a trip to the same place a second time is because you've done the groundwork. You've had the experience of the place. You know how to sell it to people because it's authentic. You've had that experience. Um, so that, that can be helpful. But then again, you know, is, every retreat going to sell out the next year again, or is every yoga adventure going to fill up? It really varies. 
Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I asked because I was curious about the financial aspect of it because as a yoga teacher, it's, it's tough if you're going to take an extra week off. It means, you know, subbing out your regular classes at home, um, and then paying for your additional accommodation and food overseas, which is usually cheaper than your home country, especially if you're traveling to, um, a place like Petra or a place like Bali or something like that or Mexico. Um, have you ever, ever had any, I guess, like, not good experiences because the place hasn't been what they advertised or the tour guide hasn't been as good or has everything always kind of just worked out? Um, well, ultimately everything kind of works out, but that doesn't mean it's not without some ouches along the way. You know, I think the biggest thing is, is like, uh, so for instance, traveling through India, you, you may be staying at one of the best places available in that region of India right? It may be the best, but the best in that region may not be up to par with the best in other regions. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, it really varies. And so, yes, this is the best place that I could bring you to, but yeah, the electricity doesn't work so well, or there's something going on that, you know, and, and I think most people adjust to that. It may be you didn't get that great night's sleep, or you felt a little inconvenience, or there wasn't hot water in the morning when you wanted it to be. So, you know, I just have to remind people, you're in an, another country. This is the flow here. This is the best we could do in this situation. And that, that's when you have to step out. You know, that's when you're wearing more than one hat as a yoga teacher, you know, to get people to open to. And, and usually they adjust. You know, usually they may not be happy with something if something like that comes up. Maybe the food's not as great. Maybe you've eaten at three restaurants in a row or stayed in three hotels before you got to this one, which were like, like state-of-the-art fabulous. And now this one is less than, and so it really stands out as being like, oh, this is miserable. You know, but, but in fact, in order for us to get to the Taj Mahal by sunrise tomorrow morning, this is where we're staying, you know. And, and then they usually adjust. But it's it's those kinds of things, um, uh, just expectation, you know, and not having been there to scout through it before or not having an alternative. You know, there is no other place outside of staying in a tent for the night. You know, this is it. Yeah, no, I, I love your attitude around it. I mean, it's it sounds like it's just like, you know, we have to have a conversation about the fact that, you know, this is the only option. And um, having traveled quite a bit myself, I definitely understand I definitely understand that concept. I guess to you, probably a part of that is, is how you market the travel trips. It's not like, Hey, come to this luxury yoga and spa retreat place in Costa Rica. That's five stars with this, you know, organic food. It's like, we're going to India and it's going to be awesome, but it's going to be an adventure. That's absolutely correct. You know, and I, in my groups to India, you know, there are other people who have, are seasoned travelers, but when they get to India, you know, it's like off the off the mark for them. There's something like, you know, they're not used to seeing that level of poverty. They're not used to seeing, you know, staying in a five star hotel and then seeing people living on the street right outside your window. You know, it's uh, that kind of extreme they may not be accustomed to, and so that's part of their experience. You know, yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely. And I'm curious, as as the yoga teacher running these trips, how do you manage your energy levels? Oh, uh, it, it's a tough one. I, I um, uh, uh, it can be tough. You know, often like anything, when the group is like spot on and the energy is really good, then that carries you a lot further than when there is some kind of mm, what some kind of. Uh, dis-ease within the group somewhere, you know, there's a person or a group of people that are like, have a particular energy going on that's not conducive for the whole group. Um, so those things will make a huge difference. I, I always try to definitely get in my own practice. It is tough, you know, when you're getting up at crack of dawn to be out of this hotel, to get to the airport here so you can travel here, so you can do this. Uh, so I may do it later in the day. Um, I definitely try to maintain my meditation practice and yoga nidra practice helps a lot uh, for the, my little down times. You know, also when you're traveling like this as a teacher, you're all, you're jet lagged with everybody else. You know, unless you've gotten there early, you're going through some of the same 
adjustments that your guests are. And so that can be, you know, a, a bit challenging as well. And uh, again, that's the difference of them coming to you at a retreat center where you're sitting there and they come to you. You know, that's a lot different. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've talked to a couple of people on the podcast about running retreats, but it's it's definitely been more of like the traditional yoga retreat. And I'm just thinking about I'm often really exhausted when I'm on sort of these like short compact trips where maybe you have a long haul flight, you're dealing with jet lag, you're dealing with new culture, there's a language barrier, maybe it's somewhere that's totally out of your comfort zone and you're completely like sensory overload. And so right. taking all of that and then sort of being the leader of this trip and then also facilitating the yoga side of things, it seems like it could be a lot. Yeah, it can be. And, you know, so in part on some of the bigger trips, you know, I do pick like good hotels so that, that they have those comforts that they get at least a good 24 hours of just hanging out at the hotel and taking little visits into the city or town that we're in before we start getting on the bus and taking off, you know. So I, I really allow and, and make sure and, and often I encourage people to come in a few days early if they can, you know, so they can start acclimatizing before we start start the trip but that definitely is is a challenge a lot of people can't you know you you leave work on this day you get in the plane that night and you're in the next country the next day you know uh so it, it really varies yeah yeah for sure um yeah jet lag is like a whole other thing to kind of consider within everything else mm -hmm. there's so many moving pieces it sounds like with running these travel trips yeah and you know again uh Yoga can provide uh, through the d distinguished practices uh, the things that will help with jet lag, things that will help bringing uh, that kind of uh, equanimity and adjustment or acclimatization in a lot more expedient way. Uh, usually your yoga students aren't drinking a lot of alcohol. I mean, that certainly does happen on travel trips, but you know, there's just a, a sort of consciousness about it. And, and so that with the right practice can help stabilize everything a lot quicker sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's amazing how your personal practice can help with, with so many different things all the way from, you know, managing energy to keeping your emotions stable to your physical mental health to helping with jet lag. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's definitely that. And, you know, I definitely, I'm still challenged with a lot of that sometimes because I want, I just feel a tremendous responsibility. Like these people have come out on to this side of the world to be with me to do something. I want it to be, you know, top notch and, and to avoid as many pit holes as possible. And so I'm often adjusting to a lot of that going like, okay, and this is what it is. This is the best I can do right now. So it's a constant lesson for me, and I do try to stay a day or two after everybody goes home. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give yourself that time to decompress before you go back Absolutely. to regular life. A lot. But usually what happens is then I'm in some country, so it's like, yes, I'll teach at your studio today, sure. You know, and it's like <laughs> so the group leaves, and then I'm teaching you know, at the local studio or something. So I don't know. It's not my best attribute. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing because then you get this opportunity to teach somewhere that's new somewhere else in the world, make those connections, have that experience. But then I guess you don't get like the downtime that you've kind of scheduled that time for. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're planning these trips, do you, do you plan in downtime for, for the people who are on, on the, the trips? Uh, e yeah. Uh, absolutely. And that could, downtime could be like uh, sitting by the Dead Sea or being in the pool or having massages or, you know, and and, and I'll, I'll try to pace like on the days that we have some really, um, you know, there's always a couple of days where you have to do so much traveling to cover so many things. And then once those sort of tighter travel periods are done, then I make sure that there's like, two days at the same hotel where we've got the pool and we've got time for lots of yoga and we've got time to, you know, you're on your own tonight. You can walk to this restaurant here, a few suggestions, you go do this on your own, you know, so that not everything is, 
is um, organized to the most minute detail. Okay, yeah, that that's a great idea. It kind of gives people like that balance, I guess. Because I was thinking about how you know a lot of people do finish up work, hop on a plane that night, fly you know, directly to that place, they have exactly the time of the retreat and then they get home and they go right back to work. And as amazing as it is to experience somewhere new and have like a jam packed, you know, week or two weeks or whatever it is, sometimes what the body really needs is that like time to decompress. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Like, like, you know, most of us don't have that kind of lifestyle where we can really just do the thing. You know, I mean, even going to like a meditation retreat a lot of times is like, you know, it always cracks me up, like how stressful it is getting organized to go sit for a week. You know, just, it's like, you know, to be stressed out about going to meditation retreat. And that's even like a local, Cool event, you know, and it's still like, oh my god, and and you know, you saw, it used to be, I used to work in the film business when I first started teaching, and I worked in the art department and you know, props and all that kind of stuff, and there were a couple of meditation retreats that I came off of that I was on a new job the next day, and I just, I used to tell people it was like shifting gears without a clutch, you know, it's <laughs> just there's no, you do your best, but it's it's not a, a experience you want to do often, you know, yeah, and the ideal. Is like you, you know, have a day off before you leave. You have a few days off when you come back. You know, I don't know many people that can afford to do that on a number of levels. So uh, not just financially. Yeah, no, definitely. I feel like that's that's something. The older I get, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to take a trip, I like need a day to do laundry. But then it's like my bank account doesn't allow for that. <laughs> Well, and then like India, like India is so intense, even if you're staying in the best hotels and even if, you know, it's, it's a, it's a much more intense trip than being at your retreat center in Costa Rica. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so even, even though you've just had this amazing experience, you definitely need time to like recover when you get home. It's not one of those, uh, you know, now you're going to go home and you're going to be energized and take off to work the next day. I mean, there are certain trips that are more, um, you know, strenuous than others just by the culture, just by the climate, just by the altitude, all season, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff impacts the body on a level that we don't always think about. Um, so I'm curious where the idea for Petra first came from, because I've never met anyone who's done a travel slash yoga retreat in Petra, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, well, me, I had never heard of, I mean, I knew Petra, you know, it's one of the seventh wonders of the world. So it's the sweetest story. I, I was teaching a teacher training in San Francisco and I had like 40 or 50 students and, and there was this one woman in class who just was like a light bulb she the energy she was putting out and her attention and her just grace and it was like oh my god and i used to call her princess just to be cute about it because she was just a really sweet is a sweet very sweet woman and um so then she lived in Jordan and she lived uh, – her aunt and her family was he from California. So they were like – she'd spend chunks of time here and then chunks of time back in Jordan and where she had opened a yoga studio after she graduated from her teacher training. And after she graduated that s- summer, I taught a retreat in New Mexico and she and her aunt came and took that. And she'd just gotten engaged and she said, you know, you've got to come to my wedding. You know, it's going to be huge. It's going to be a really big deal. And, you know, Jordanian weddings are like these huge big, big deals, kind of like Indian weddings, only like one up from that. Oh, wow. And, um, <laughs> yeah, huge. Like I'll tell you about it in a sec. But uh, so I said, okay, well, and she goes, you know, and you can teach at my new studio and we'll put you up and, you know, I'm going, okay, that's a big trip and I would love to be there. And, you know, yeah. So, so, um, and then I go, well, if I'm going to come out, you know, why don't I, you know, put together a trip? Because this is what I've been, this is what I've done. So, and she said, well, there there is, you know, I've done one trip like this where I brought some people to Jordan and took them. There's, you know, there's certain things that you do in a country. It's not like you have to make up the whole thing from scratch. You, you know, if, if Petra's on your list and the Dead Sea is on your list and Wadi Rum Desert and this and that, you know, there's your trip. It starts organizing itself. It's like if you're in India, of course you're going to the Taj Mahal. Of course you're going to go to Varanasi. You know, there's just certain 
things you do. So it, it's just lining those things up and seeing how you make that flow happen. So, so that's how we, we put it together. And, um, and that's basically how I, I had never considered like, oh yeah, let's go, let's go to Jordan. <laughs> you know, I knew Petra. I didn't know what country it was in for sure. It was like, I know it's over there somewhere. And, uh, and, and then, you know, and then I got to go to the wedding. So it did work out. And I went to the wedding. The wedding was like 1600 people, sit down dinner, bands from all over the world. I mean, it was like a 24 hour wedding with, with breakfast served at 7 a.m. You know, for those that stayed dancing all night, it was just insane. So that was my main connection there. And I'm so grateful because Jordan is an amazing country. I've never felt safer in in a country i mean because uh what i mean by that is like in india for instance uh you know so many of the vendors will constantly be at you trying to get you to buy something you know there's that urgency about like we need you and so as a tourist you feel very marked and you know you're definitely the person that they're expecting to buy something and in jordan there was none of that pressure the weather was perfect the food was amazing Petra is phenomenal. Uh, Wadi Rum, the desert where The Martian was filmed, where Lawrence of Arabia was filmed, where anytime they want to film off the planet, they go there, and there's good reason for that. It's spectacular. And and then you've got the Dead Sea, and you've got all the Christian and Judeo history there. This is the part of the world where all of that started from, you know. And you've got – you're looking at Israel across the Dead Sea and and – it's everything is just right there. So it turned out to be the most amazing trip and a great group of people and, you know, floating in the Dead Sea and going to hot springs in the middle of the desert and doing all this stuff. It was just amazing. And so I'm, I've decided, you know, to, to go back one more time again, because the groundwork is laid because people saw pictures on Facebook and they were going like, Oh my God, I'm coming with you next time because it, it, it's also like in India where you can't take a bad picture because everything is so colorful and so uh, impressive that you just aim your phone or your camera and you've got this great picture. And so because people had seen that, and because there was momentum, I decided, well, this is like free, free, free marketing. So let's do it again next year. And uh, because I had such a great experience, I want people to come with me because – they won't believe it until they get there, just how great it is. And, you know, who knows how long we'll be able to travel to these parts of the world and how long these uh, ruins will be there and, and you know, uh, uh, us being able to travel like that. So I feel it's uh, definitely worth uh, people's time and money to get out there and have an experience. In, in Petra, really a remarkable country. Yeah, definitely. That's amazing to hear. A uh, 1,600-person wedding sounds incredible, highly stressful if you're the bride and groom, <laughs> and like such uh, a cool experience. Uh, it was it, it was one of those things where like you're there and it's it's like I knew it was like when I got there and I realized oh she really is a princess i mean she you would never get that from her she would never talk about it that way but basically you know you i called you princess and in fact you really are princess and in fact this street is named after your family's name and <laughs> and in fact they just put in a road for the reception so that people could get through this sort of uh jungle area a lot easier you know it was crazy and it in itself was uh, worth the experience of wow and it was mixed with her yoga friend and then diplomats and and then people from all over the place. It was just insanely fun. Yeah, that sounds like an unreal experience. So cool. Um, so your retreat is coming up in a couple of months. It's in, yeah, May. in May. And what are the dates for that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's May 16th through May 26th. Okay, awesome. So if anyone out there is listening and has been convinced that they should go to Petra, uh, those are the dates. And where can people find out more about about the travel trip? Well, uh, the whole itinerary is posted on my website, which is moryoga.com, and that's M-O-R-Y-O-G-A.com. And then there's a section for retreats, and you just scroll down. It says Journey to Petra, and... Um, it's all there. Uh, pictures from last year, video clips, dust doing yoga, 
all the main sites, the buses, the food, everything's there. And also people's testimonies who went on this experience last year who were so grateful that they did. So it's really uh, cool to be able to look at the whole thing on the website. There'll be some changes, but there'll be minor, uh, you know, which I'll know more about as the trip gets closer. Amazing. That's awesome. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with listeners about running yoga retreats, being a yoga teacher in general, running travel trips? Mm. Wow. Um, you know, I think what we talked about earlier is, is the, the thing that's the most impressive to me at least, which is having watched yoga come from this very organic, thing for for thousands of years right into this very commercialized and and produced um process and and that you know there's definitely still you can still connect and find the origin of those uh authentic teachings with some investigation um but to be able to distinguish between between what is commercial, what has become accepted by the norm, uh, and what is authentic to yoga. I know there's somebody doing goat yoga now. That's a big deal in Oregon. And, you know, it just like, to me, it's just, it's laughable. Yes, I understand people get therapeutic benefits about being with animals, but, you know, if you look at any of the classic yogic texts, it was not about doing yoga with your animals. <laughs> you know, it just <laughs> it wasn't about uh, binging all night and then going to yoga class so that you can detox. You know, it just wasn't how it was intended to be. So I'm just saying that you know it is a very different world, and you can find some very authentic teachers out there still. But it also takes uh, some real discernment on on the student's behalf of, of like really finding what, what really makes them thrive and what also challenges them in a healthy way and take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that piece of advice. I kind of forgot about goat yoga. I obviously saw it on social media months back, but I forgot that that was actually a thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I will put a link to your website on the show notes so that people can go check out your retreat in Petra. It sounds like it's going to be absolutely amazing. And David, I really appreciate your time today. It was awesome getting to talk with you. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I appreciate talking to you too and knowing that you're out in one of my favorite countries out in Bali. So enjoy that and I'll look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you. All right. So there's the episode with David Moreno. Hopefully you have learned a lot about what it takes to lead travel trips, the difference between travel trips and yoga retreats and so much more. And like David said, you can connect with him at moreyoga.com, M-O-R-Y-O-G-A.com. I put a link up on the show notes. That's at www.mbmyoga.com. Once again, just a quick reminder that I am offering 30 minute coaching sessions and you can find that at mbmyoga.youcanbook.me and that link is also up on the show notes for this episode. So as always, thank you so much for listening and namaste.